Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to Tools, Techniques, and Mental Models for Success series. In this series, I look at different tools, different ways that people can apply those tools and techniques to improving their project management practices and business success practices. In today's video log, we're going to be looking at Pandemics to Project Management, the good, the bad, and the ugly. What PM practices can we take away from what's been occurring? I think there's a lot we can learn from the past year on the pandemic, and I think there's a lot of application of project management that those of us that work in the field of project management readily see, and for those of us that don't, I think you'll have a better appreciation of what's been going on this past year from a perspective of let's try to come out of this very, very strong and let's limit the amount of people that are hospitalized and the deaths that have been occurring. So how can we actually beat this pandemic? And project management has played a big role in it. So I framed it the good, the bad and the ugly. Uh, if you're familiar with the Clint Eastwood uh, movie, um, there's a lot of good things uh, that um, we applied to this pandemic and we're still just emerging from it, right? So uh, there's things that may change from what I say here today. Uh, one of the things was there, there it was just such an extraordinary uh, issue worldwide, global, everybody impacted uh, that uh, there was a very large response from governments, especially wealthier governments that actually had the ways and means of moving towards some solution. So as far as uh, money being made available, that I would say was not a big issue. You know, initially there might have been, this isn't such a big issue and it might have been held back longer than it should have. But once things were pretty clear that this is a major disaster, uh, then definitely there was a lot of very quick uh, commitments. Uh, there was a lot of, in the background, a lot of new and evolving uh, biotechnologies uh, going on. And we've been advancing as a civilization uh, really, really quickly over the last couple of decades. And there was a lot of basis for hope in the vaccine area already uh, with some of the new technologies being developed. So this was a, a clear opportunity with the proper investment to be able to have a very strong, robust response uh, to that and to be coming out of it with a lot of development that can be useful in the future. So that's a very good and positive story there. Uh, we have a large dedicated workforce that could, with the, the money and the um, focus behind them, would be ready and able to actually work on resolving and protecting people. And I mean by protections, I mean in preventative actions as well, such as, you know, development, quick uh, construction of masks, uh, alcohol, other supplies. Now, I will say, it did take a long time to get that engine rolling and there was a lot of issues. So we'll talk about um, the bad and the ugly. So I'm not trying to paint an overly rosy picture in that area, but definitely uh, we did come around that at a certain point. Um, we also, the best and the brightest, you know, if you're a research scientist, uh, if, you're, if you're in this uh, area of uh, trying to develop vaccines, this would be a project that you would definitely want to be working on. And this would be a project that would really sort of uh, be engaging and motivating for you because there would be such a, a human um, benefit to the work that you do. So anybody that uh, is operating at the top of their game was interested in working on this type of uh, advancement. Um, multiple simultaneous efforts. Now, with that, you can think about, you know, normally when a vaccine would be developed, it would take a long time. In fact, when this first started the pandemic, it was interesting. I can remember, you know, there was very sort of negative kind of, not that there's not always negative news, but there was a lot of negativity in the news media and interviews with um, basically some uh, top medical uh, researchers and advisors and political strategists, etc. And it was like, uh, typically a vaccine takes 10 years. The fastest one was four years. And that was really deflating to a lot of the public. Uh, but I thought when I saw that, well, this individual or these individuals, they're not project managers. 
and they don't really understand how and what you can actually accomplish when you have the right resources in place. Yes, four, they were quite correct. Historically, four years, 10 years, you know, spread and even more in developing a successful vaccine. But never in the history was there so much money and so much focus and so much effort put towards finding a vaccine, which means instead of doing it very linearly, you know, we've got this group, they're working on this vaccine. Oh, this didn't work. Okay, we'll start this again. And it was very linear. The advantage was, of course, you could have multiple simultaneous efforts by all of the pharmaceutical businesses that work in this realm, and even those that were just developing the technologies as well. And so that was a huge advantage, also that they would be able to be supported in their endeavors for the most part. I'm quite sure not everybody was, but for the most part, there was a lot of support financially. So now, instead of doing something very linear and go back and this fails and go back and this fails and trying to come up with a solution, you had a multitude of vaccines being developed at the same time. I thought of uh, Jim Collins at the time, and he had been interviewed, I think it was by Tim Ferriss, uh, at least more recently, and he's talked about this bullets to cannonball uh, example. And, you know, it's like uh, the most successful businesses, they don't just put all their money in one basket and shoot the cannonball and then find out it misses, right? Well, from a global perspective, you wouldn't want to say, we're just working on this one vaccine, all the money's going into this one vaccine, and then if it misses, then we got to start again. Much better to have it going into a hundred different vaccines. And if 80 of them miss, then we've got 30 that we're working on. And then if we miss a bunch more in the next set of trials that they do, then we've still got 10 that we're, then, that we're working on. And so even if we end up with one, that would be a win. But we ended up with a whole bunch of different vaccines that actually um, passed. So that's project management when you start thinking about the aspect of, well, you can do things simultaneously. When can you schedule things? Can you have things going on concurrently? And um, what is the factors that's pushing this? And when we say historically there's never been so much money available, well, that's because it's historically it's never cost so much money. When you think about the disruption that's been caused um, to the economies of um, the world. Uh, and proactively, while simultaneously developing vaccines, there's a whole bunch of things that could be, when it's done well, uh, done simultaneously. Uh, expansion of uh, manufacturing for masks, for ventilators, uh, for all the PPE equipment. And these can be done simultaneously and proactively as well. Now, like, could they have been, now we're, there's, we're going to talk about learning too. There's a lot of things that we've learned from this that we could have gone into this way better prepared. We went into this in full reactive mode. So don't make any mistake about that. We went into this like, fully unprepared for it. Uh, but we are very capable as a uh, global society. And when we get into the project management side of things, if we have the best and the brightest of project managers work on this, we can also organize things very, very well. So for all those project managers, the thousands that have been working on this, you should be very proud of the work that you've been um, doing. Now, were we faced with constraints? This has, as I said, this is like project management 101, this whole um, aspect of the pandemic and trying to come out of it in a successful way. And you can see the struggles that go on as well. In typical project management, we look at time, cost, quality, right? We also look at scope. What are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to prevent this thing. We're trying to get herd immunity we're trying to better manage this COVID, right? And so we have a certain scope of what we're trying to accomplish. We've got a very clear identified scope. And of course, when we think about quality, and this is usually the triangle and that that I use for construction projects, because that's my thing is construction management, we include safety. But just as easily for a pandemic, Quality and safety, they kind of go hand in hand. We're talking about the quality of the vaccines. We're talking about the safety to the people that are getting the vaccine. That's me getting the, vac the first um, 
shot of AstraZeneca. And so there's a lot of, you know, concern uh, by the public. And we have to understand that too, that there's a lot of reasons for that concern because there is an interrelationship typically here. When you rush something, very often that means it's going to cost more. So in this case, that would be a for sure. It's definitely, you know, if you had time and you could take your time with it and you could probably uh, manage it better and you wouldn't have to do all of those simultaneous uh, efforts uh, because a lot of them aren't going to pan out, uh, then you could for sure save a lot of money. But time is a big factor, huge factor in the development of the vaccine. And the other ones are quality and safety. Well, what good is it to develop a vaccine if nobody wants it because it's going to do more damage than uh, getting the disease itself, you know, the cure is worse than the disease. So that's a big concern. So there's been a lot of effort too uh, into making sure that it, the vaccines are safe and that they are able to um, provide a much better outcome uh, to squash uh, the spread of uh, COVID. Now, are they 100% safe? I don't think anybody would say any vaccine is 100% safe. But are they, you just have to look at the countries that have been um, getting uh, the herd immunity or quickly uh, vaccinating the public and how quickly uh, those numbers are dropping and their death rates are dropping uh, to see the impact that those vaccines are having. Um, so there's a lot of positive aspects that come out of it, but I'm talking about project management here. Hey, there is this interrelationship here, right? There is an interrelationship here. And what is what are our acceptable tolerances in here that we can live with? We have to work to, to reach the overall goal to have a very successful, valid vaccine that the public has trust in and that is doing the job that it's intended to do. So we, we face these interrelationships with the constraint. You see it all the time. And we sometimes have setbacks too. We sometimes have setbacks and then we have to make adjustments and iterate and a lot of other actions that take place just like a real project. So that's those are some of the um, constraints faced and the good items. Uh, the bad items are, you know what, when this thing broke out, huge demand for specific items. So what does that mean? It means it's sold out, right? And the supply chain, thinking of the supply chain, very often it's only as strong as its weakest link. And so if one element in that supply chain collapses, then you can't get certain things very easily. So there was huge demand for specific things. And I'm not talking about toilet paper necessarily. I'm talking more about PPE equipment, uh, etc., medical supplies that um, we had low inventories in. Anything that aided in the prevention of and treatment quickly sold out. As I said, the supply chains were disrupted. Where we actually make things, you know, very often there would be a spread in the factories because people were working close together, close proximity to each other. Our factories weren't designed to have spatial requirements, uh, a lot of uh, air exchanges per hour and filtering of the air. They just weren't developed that way. So again, we're in full reactive mode with those elements. We've really done a great job of manufacturing and constructing things while keeping low inventories. Uh, one of the things that I do in construction management is lean construction. And if you study lean manufacturing and lean construction, you know that low inventories or just in time in the manufacturing sector is a big deal, right? Because it, it allows for a continuous flow of work without having too much things take up too much space. One of the things I love about lean construction methodology though is it doesn't say just in time, it says at the most responsible moment. So in this case, you could quickly adapt and see that the most responsible moment means that we have to have um, larger inventory. So certain identifications from things, there's a lot of learning that can come out of this that we need to make sure that we have certain stocks of inventory that would be acceptable in the future if this occurs again. Uh, so we were, we were stuck with low in inventories and not enough capacity to build up those inventories initially. All right, so initially, no doubt about it, full reactive mode, and that's not something any project manager wants to be in for very long. Uh, project managers that are in reactive mode on an ongoing basis, they tend to burn out over time. 
Uh, so the goal is obviously to get turn the ship around and be able to be more proactive and that way we can face the things that we're actually reactive in. The ugly, all right, so this thing here, the ugly. Um, managing fear, expectations, delays, and waves, first wave, second wave, third wave, hopefully not fourth wave. Uh, and that, that instills a fearful public, right? We, you know, the public is unsure, they're scared, they don't know what's going on. Um, so we do lockdowns and to protect the public as a result because we don't want to overwhelm our hospital systems. Well, that gets angry business owners very angry, right? Because their businesses, they didn't necessarily have reserves in place to survive like a year and a half of on and off shutdowns. Uh, very, very difficult for even the, the most proactive and look ahead thinking businesses from that perspective. So you end up with a lot of angry business owners. And then of course, inconsistency in how things were shut down and not a consistent message. You know, when we think about expectations, you want to set the right expectations with the public and you want to try to be reasonably consistent. And I don't mean consistent that you stay with the same thing if it's not working, but I mean consistency between municipal governments, provincial governments, federal governments, or the same thing in the states, municipal governments, state governments, federal governments. More consistent messaging there and a more united focus. And that makes for a, a very impatient public when you have those kind of uh, things that the expectations are not clear, you have inconsistency in the messaging and in the way that the messaging is taking place and the changes of lockdown rules, etc. Uh, misinformation. You have to build the trust of the people that you're working with. So misinformation is not the way to do it. Now you might do it for some of the right reasons, but people aren't stupid, right? So, you know, if you start saying that um, you, you know, we don't, the masks, nobody needs masks. And meanwhile, you keep saying the hospitals need more masks. You know, it doesn't take the brightest crayon in the pack to sort of look at that and say, why would hospitals need masks from this COVID, but yet the public doesn't need masks from COVID? Like, why, what's, where's this headed, right? So there began with some mistrust. Now, I said for the right purposes. I don't think anybody was trying to be uh, malicious about it, but I think they were trying to protect hospital workers in that they could procure and keep enough masks. So again, that was the failing in the proactive side of having enough PPE for this kind of situation if it came up in the first place. Um, so misinformation and loss of trust. Oh, if you're actually, think about this, there's a lot of takeaways from this to you if you're a project manager. Think about just your regular projects. If you give misinformation to a client, they're not going to trust you with what things that you're going to provide them with in the future. They're going to be more skeptical. They may, you may start to build more trust after a period of time, but it is difficult to get that trust back. Much better to try to be honest and transparent as possible, or at least not say something that's not true. Um, and even if you don't know, it'd be better to say you don't know instead of, no, you don't know, it's okay, uh, you don't need masks, masks aren't an issue. Well, if you don't know, it'd be better to say we are working on it and we're looking at it and we're trying to figure this out. Um, then there's the other side of the ugly, which is the unknown unknowns. So depending on when you look at this, some other unknown unknowns may have occurred in this particular example that may be coming up. Uh, and we always talk about this in project management. There's the known knowns, the things you know you know. Sometimes that's a problem if you think you know something and you really don't. That's another whole story. The known unknowns, the things we know but we're not sure of. Well, that could be uh, some of the aspects of things like masks and is this airborne or is this not? You know, it could be. You knew that from the beginning. You just weren't sure. And then the unknown unknowns. Do we know if another variant that could be much more contagious or severe could come out of the COVID that's going around right now? And will the vaccines that we just developed protect us, right? So that's the ugly, right? We really don't know some of those unknown unknowns as I speak, uh, and they could be problematic. But that's project management too. Any project that you work on, there are always these unknown unknowns. Doesn't matter how good you are at projects, they come up. 
But what you want to do is try to have mitigated as many as you can so that at least there's much fewer opportunities in the unknown unknowns or you're not getting caught with known unknowns, things you should have been better prepared for. And that's a big part of making sure that you've done the legwork and the planning and the investigation and that you have enough contingencies in place and that you're acting upon them in a very, very timely fashion. Keep focused on the end goals. Like, you know, you have something that you're working towards. Keep focused on, on that. And if there's something that needs to adjust or change, then be willing to do that if you have to change your scope. And be willing, you know, uh, and I've got it in an upcoming slide, you know, plans, plans are nothing, but planning is everything. The old Eisenhower quote, right? And that just means that, yes, uh, we could have had the perfect pandemic plan going into this. And indeed, governments had pandemic plans. I'm quite sure that every major government had a pandemic plan. But uh, if you go with the old uh, Mike Tyson quote, um, right, everybody has a plan till they get punched in the mouth. Well, I guess uh, the world kind of got punched in the mouth in this case, right? Uh, but the ability to continue to plan, to continue to iterate, 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 adjust, pivot, be agile, um, be responsive to things uh, is extremely important. And I think we've been doing a pretty good job, not so much the first three months, but definitely uh, once we actually um, started to get a foothold and traction, uh, definitely. Um, so have contingencies working in advance of requirements. In a situation like this, where we said money is not the issue, um, that gives you the opportunity to have a look ahead, look at possible um, contingencies and delays that might occur and have them already in place and working for you so there's not such a gap or a wait period. Uh, which, again, in cases like right now, they are already working on uh, vaccines and booster vaccines in case the variants start to get more aggressive. Uh, that just means that down the road, it'd be a lot quicker to um, develop uh, that vaccine and get it into play, uh, which is a good thing because now we will have ramped up the facilities uh, that would be able to produce it. So it's not going to be this continuous that it takes as long as it's been taking. It'll be faster as we get better, right? Faster as we get better. Often slow is smooth and smooth is fast, uh, as the saying goes. Uh, so we're making sure that we're doing uh, research, testing, looking at multiple pathways and options, the bullets to cannonballs. The bullet to cannonball aspect is we shoot 100 bullets and we get uh, 7 or 8 or 10 vaccines out of that. Marvelous. Great. Uh, and that's been, a, that's been one of the wonders that we've been able to achieve. We did have the technology and we were able to do it. 100% would we know that with a future type pandemic that we could actually develop it that quick? You wouldn't. That would be kind of an unknown for sure, but we would be in a much better position to do it in the future. So that's some of the positive aspects coming out of this. Uh, continuously learn through this cycle uh, in order to continuously improve. And as I, I have in an upcoming slide, you know, some of the things that we do in project management now allows us to have the tools and the techniques that we can run through that we, will allow us to get better as we iterate to be, have higher quality vaccines, to have um, faster uh, cycles, time cycles, and indeed at that point to make the costs uh, much more effective and the distribution and logistics better so that we can distribute it better to um, the less wealthy countries in the world, the poorer countries in the world, which again, there's a lot of room for improvement in. Um, how we must have very thorough and rigorous uh, project reviews for what's been going on. So we can really analyze it and we can take what we've learned, which there's got to be so much learning that can come out that we don't want to waste that. We want to make sure that we're able to cycle that through in future processes and be better prepared the next time. But I do qualify that. And this is something that you should also know. Know that the next time will be different. It usually is. You know, I, I was uh, reading uh, the mag, uh, I probably pronounce it wrong, uh, the Maginot Line, which was basically in World War I uh, with the, uh, in France. And it was kind of, it was built to prevent Germany from invading France. And it was this pristine uh, barriers and bunkers that were built that there was no way that the Germans were supposed to be able to 
um, cross it. But the problem was it was built based on World War I and based on really the technologies that were built in World War I and without the full understanding of the technologies of that time and what they were able to do. And well, of course, history we know, uh, France fell very, very quickly uh, during the uh, early uh, months of World War II, very, very quickly. So uh, World War I did not repeat itself the same way. And no, the next time will be different, it usually is, but also take actions to be prepared for something similar to this, but also something that may be quite different uh, than this. And that's where a lot of creative, innovative, other, um, other viewpoints can help in that preparedness uh, for those kind of situations. So we definitely want to come out of this with a lot more learning from that perspective. So what have we learned? As I said, know that the next time will be different. It usually is. The impossible is often not impossible when the right people are engaged and work collaboratively. I didn't mention that when this first occurred uh, and they said it was going to take four to ten years, my wife was very upset at the time. I said to her, it's going to take about a year. I'm pretty sure it's going to take about a year. How do you know that? And I said, well, like I said, they've never had so much uh, money. They've never had so much focus, uh, support in one area that you could run so many simultaneous efforts uh, and it's going to drastically shorten the schedule. So with your own projects, whatever they may be, you know, you may initially think it's impossible. Look at it very carefully and don't get into the planning fallacy where you get utopian with no logic behind it. There was a lot of logic behind why this would have been shorter. And actually, I said it was going to take over a year for a vaccine. So I, was, I actually wrote it in the back of uh, my journal at the time. And I said the date and everything. I was actually wrong. I was wrong by three months. They had it out three months earlier. So uh, there you go. And I, w I thought I was being totally optimistic with that. Uh, and then the next thing, of course, was, well, they're saying that they're not going to have the vaccine in 2021. Well, you saw I was getting the shot very quickly afterwards, so uh, not quick enough, you know, not quick enough. We could do better, uh, definitely, and there's a, I'm very empathetic to the lives that have been lost. You know, my students, I've, I've, I've had some hard days because I've had students that have been really sick with COVID. I've had, um, you know, various students that have lost parents, which is just agonizing. Um, to be sure. So definitely in future, we could do a lot better in this. We want to learn from what happened. We want to get better at it, right? Uh, there's been good things, but there's been a lot of bad things in this process too that we can learn from. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Project management skills, you know, a lot of the things that we use, uh, uh, things like the OODA loop, observe, orient, um, decide, act for very quick, agile decision making after John Boyd's kind of, of development of that. Uh, PDCA or PDSA, plan, do, check, act, or plan, do, study, act. It becomes vital in these kind of processes where we want to iterate and adjust, study and adjust and improve as we go along. Um, understanding the implications of VUCA. We live in a very volatile uh, uh, society, society. There's a lot of things that have levels of volatility that we don't fully comprehend. We have a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we have a ton of complexity. Complexity, though, with the time and the effort and the knowledge and the money and support behind it, we can deal with, right? We also have uh, ambiguity very often where we don't have clarity. We don't have transparency. Sometimes the communication lines aren't done well. We don't set the right expectations. We have to get those things better. And by understanding that and applying it to our projects, it'll make us that much stronger. And expect to iterate, know that we're gonna iterate, manage public expectations because they're having a tough time, right? And we have different viewpoints among the public. And it's understandable. We all have different experiences in life and different viewpoints at looking at things. And try not to get too upset with each other. That's the other thing. In projects, we got to have good engagement and collaboration with our project teams or else it becomes a very adversarial process. And so we have to keep that in mind. As I said, this, there's a lot of comparisons that we can make to project management with this whole cycle we've been dealing with during the last year. Uh, we also know that new technologies 
thank goodness, are now in a position for rapid advancement. They've been rapidly advancing, but I believe as a result of this past year, we are going to be moving forward with a lot more medical breakthroughs, just like after, unfortunately, like World War II, you know, we really sort of ramped up uh, the aspect of antibiotics and a lot of other uh, medicinal supplies as a result of all the carnage that took place during World War II. Sometimes there can be some good things that come out of some bad things if we look for it and we work on it. People can be challenging at the best of times, and this certainly was not the best of times. So uh, these kind of things, that means that we have to really develop our social skills and our um, basically our soft skills and how we deal with people. If we get really good at that, we can get a lot more done. Being yelling and screaming at each other is not going to help. Uh, so it's often better to under-promise and over-deliver without having people lose hope. So, yeah, I wouldn't say that we're going to have a vaccine sooner than later. Uh, you know, and I look back and I said, you know, the researchers they're talking to, even Anthony Fauci, you know, uh, it's going to take four years uh, or four years was the quickest we've been able to do it. It seemed a little bit deflating at the time, but all of a sudden then it's much easier a few months later to say, well, I'm starting to get more confident that we'll have it within a year and a half. And a few more months later, uh, by the end of the year, may be possible. And a few more months later, maybe by November. Uh, so it's, it's just... Um, at least if you're saying, oh yeah, we'll have a vaccine in two more months, that would not be a good thing. You would lose the public trust when that two months comes and that two months goes and you don't have it. Uh, so you have to be really managing that process really, really well. Um, I would say to uh, look up the Stockdale paradox if you're trying to look at uh, a way of um, viewing those kind of points when you're in something and it's really not good uh, a good a good way of looking at things. And the Stockdale Paradox, named after James Stockdale, was, who was a POW in the Vietnam War and was, you know, in very dire situations. He had a certain way of understanding the current reality that he was in, while at the same time having hope and faith that it would get better, without being delusional about it. Uh, so uh, that's a big part of how you manage your clients in projects and deliver on those projects that way. It's a big deal, not just in COVID, but it's a big deal for those clients that they really need this project for whatever the reason is, whatever the project is. So that's what I wanted to cover today. Uh, hopefully um, there's some takeaways from that that uh, you can apply to your projects. I know just me putting together and thinking this process through is helping me visualize a few things a little bit differently in how I deliver uh, my courses and how I work with some of my clients uh, in construction uh, management and construction projects in my consulting business. So I'm Tom Stevenson wishing you a wonderful day and things will improve as we learn from them together. If you have some comments or ideas, please leave them in the notes. And please also, uh, if you enjoyed this uh, vlog or video lecture, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I have many, many other uh, videos under the various uh, playlists. Uh, click the notifications, click the like button, and we'll talk to you again. All the best. Tom Stevenson signing off for now.